Hello. Thank you everyone for joining us for another session of Southern Maryland RCD's Winter Seminar Series. My name is Jessica McLindsay. I'm with Southern Maryland Resource Conservation and Development in Leonardtown, Maryland. I'm going to put a link to our office in the chat if anyone's interested in learning a little bit more about our office. But enough about us. I am going to turn our presentation over. We have the wonderful Saranella Linares with us this evening. She is currently the facility director at Mount Rainier's Na Nature Center and a board member of the Mycological Association of Washington, DC, focused on DNA research committee. She loves talking about nature and the spark and to spark uh, discovery in nature, uh, which I love. So I'm glad that she's here to join us. She is my go-to expert for all things fungi. I actually met her about two years ago when she was presenting to our master naturalist class. So thank you for joining us and I'm gonna hand it over to you. Hi everyone. Um, I am very happy to be here with you tonight. Um, this is a pleasure to be in um, these spaces, these learning spaces with you. Now, a couple of uh, a couple of disclaimers. The first one is that I love to give the opportunity to everybody to connect with the content. So throughout the presentation, I encourage you to raise your hand if you have a question or a comment. The raise hand icon is at the bottom of your screen in the, <clears throat> in the reactions icon, you're gonna see raise hand, lower hand. Um, and um, I'll be able to answer your questions in the, in the order that they arrive, just like that. Um, I am working from my iPad so I cannot see you but hopefully you'll be able to see me and hear me okay. If not, please say so, so we can troubleshoot. <clears throat> and with that, I would like to start this presentation with a couple of facts that usually people don't know about. So fungi are their own kingdom. Until 1969, they were classified as in the kingdom of plants. The horror! Can you imagine thinking that a mushroom is the same thing as a plant just because it doesn't move? Really, they have a lot of differences between animals and plants, so they have been classified as their own kingdom. And they have both unicellular and multicellular lifestyles. <laughs> and for those of you who may not remember your biology class, unicellular is an individual that has only one cell and that's all it needs in its entire body. Multicellular lifestyles are things like plants and uh, you and I and animals that need many, many cells to make the individual. As such, both unicellular and multicellular lifestyles, they are, as the kingdom, the primary decomposers of cellulose in the world. Just by comparison, only a handful of species of bacteria have the what it takes to decompose cellulose. By far, the job to breaking apart the plant components, the plant cell walls to free all the nutrients inside of a cell, that job belongs to the kingdom fungi. And that happens both in terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. Now, I, by saying that happens both terrestrial and in aquatic ecosystems, it's a great segue, segue for us to start thinking, where can we find the fungi? And the answer is absolutely everywhere. In this slide, it says that we can find it from underground all the way to the stratosphere. But let me tell you, 
we have also been able to find it outside of the Earth atmosphere. And today, you'll hear a little bit about that in a couple minutes. Um, so they are everywhere. They are flying in the air. They're swimming in the water. They are connecting plants underground. And yet 90% of all the species of fungi are yet to be discovered. Isn't that wild? It's absolutely amazing to think all oh, the knowledge about fungi that there is out there just waiting for you to discover it. So every time you go outside and observe nature and observe the kingdom fungi, there is a good chance that you can discover something new. So many people, when we talk about fungi, they start picturing in their heads a mushroom. And although mushrooms are fungi, not all fungi are mushrooms. But for simplicity's sake, I want to illustrate here what mushrooms are to close the loop on the life cycle of one particular fungi. So mushrooms are the fruiting body of a fungus, just like the apples on a tree. Their function is to allow for the next generation to come to be. They disperse the spores of the individual, which is inside of the substrate that you see that mushroom in. So if you see a mushroom growing from the ground, the mycelium or the body of that individual is underground. If you see a mushroom growing from a tree, then the mycelium is inside the bark, the wood of that tree. If you see a mushroom growing from an insect, the mycelium, it's inside of that insect colonizing everything, including the brain. But I digress. So if you see a mushroom in the forest, in the ground, what you're seeing is that fruiting body that is releasing the spores. And in this gif that you're seeing, in this image that you're seeing, is basically a plume or um, a little bit of smoke that you're seeing. It's not generated by AI. It's simply thousands upon thousands upon thousands of spores being released. When those spores uh, are released into the environment, they're going to be traveling with the wind um, until they arrive to an environment that is suitable for them. How do you know if the environment is suitable for a spore? Well, I like to imagine it as if the spore coat had a million noses trying to sniff out. It's really the process of detecting via chemicals what is in the environment where the spore is in. And if the right chemicals are determined to be there, then the spore will germinate. And out of the spore, a single filament will come out that is one cell thick. Microscopic, we can't see it. That, that hyphae will continue to grow, absorb water from the environment, absorb nutrients from the environment until it becomes a tangled network. And that network, many, many hyphae together, is what we call a mycelium. 
at some point, the environment will start to dry up a little bit. And the, the nutrients have been exhausted right then and there. At that time, their environment is sending a really big message to the mycelium saying, hello, it's time to reproduce. And that mycelium that at, up to this point was microscopic, it's going to start condensing more and more and it's gonna create mycelial strands. Those we can see. So when you lift uh, the leaf litter and you see those white strands in under the leaf litter or under a log, that is the mycelium of a fungus getting ready to produce the fruiting bodies. The fruiting body starts as a button or an egg stage. And once it creates that little white egg, all the parts of the mushroom are there. They just need more water to expand. And it will do so as until it reaches maturity. And there, when the mushroom is mature, the spores will form in the spore producing surface or at the bottom of that uh, mushroom, the underside of that mushroom, and the life cycle will start again. Now, until 2010, we thought that all the mushrooms that had gills lived on the on land only, but there was a marvelous researcher that was canvassing the streams around Illinois, I believe, and found the first mushroom that we know about that is aquatic. Its name is Sathirella aquatica, and it blew our minds when we found out about it. And let me see. At the end of this presentation, you'll be able to get um, the presentation downloaded into your device via QR code. And when you do that, you'll be able to watch a short video talking about the discovery of Sathirella aquatica. Um, Sathirella aquatica is the mushroom that you see here and it's gorgeous. Um, especially because the characteristic on how does it produce the spores. This mushroom is not really well adapted to the life in water, which tells us that it's a um, very recent evolution of the species. But the way it has found to be able to release the spores into the water is to create an air bubble around the cap surface to allow the spores to drop into that air pocket by gravity like every other gilled mushroom. And then once the mushroom has finished uh, releasing those spores, that air pocket it's going to lift up and uh, release the spores into the water column. So it's, it's an amazing feat that one little mushroom has found a way to make it work in the aquatic lifestyle. Not only do we have mushrooms that are growing in the water, but it turns out there are fungi that are found outside of our atmosphere. So there is a project uh, from the Navy trying to send um, uh, molds or fungi into future uh, research vessels 
to ride around the moon to study the behavior of these fungi outside of the Earth atmosphere. And also there is a researcher that has found a way to mine minerals using terrestrial fungi. Now, this mining operation uh, comes from the fact that there are different fungi that can incorporate heavy metals into their, um, into their cells. And once those minerals get into the cells, they crystallize into more stable forms than the ionized forms that they might have in the environment. Um, and when that's the case, you have a little particle that is now living inside of the fungi and it's easier to extract. Um, so there are some cool things in the future of fungi and um, rocket science. <laughs> so we'll see what comes in 2024. I'm gonna stop right here and see if we have any questions so far. There are no questions in the chat yet, but everyone, please feel free to unmute. Feel free to turn your camera on. Okay. Great. So how are fungi related to life on Earth? Well, thanks to the State of the Fungi Report released by the Kew Royal Botanic Gardens in 2018, we have this beautiful illustration that allows us to see what really matters, <laughs> which divides the eukaryotes and prokaryotes. <laughs> um, the Tree of Life illustrations um, before then used to be very, very complex. So I'm really happy that we have a uh, better illustration that allows us to see the crown group in phylogenetics, meaning the three kingdoms that are the most evolved, the most recent, and they almost, um, they almost experience an explosive simultaneous diversification. When we look at the natural history of plants and fungal evolution, it begs us to consider that maybe that is the case because way back when, way before animals roamed the earth, plants were able to colonize terrestrial environments thanks to the symbiotic association with fungi. So many, 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 many moons ago where there was a fungus that was very lonely <laughs> and a plant that saw a lot of land, a lot of dry land, which didn't bode well for plants that are accustomed to the aquatic lifestyle. And then on earth you have minerals that are not in their aquatic, uh, in, into their uh, water soluble forms and are difficult to integrate into the roots of a plant. But you also have fungi that have the ability to break apart rocks because of their external digestion. So if a fungus, found a plant root that was willing to pay sugar for their labor, then a symbiotic asso association forms called mycorrhiza. And now that aquatic plant is protected against desiccation, is given a bigger area to mine minerals from thanks to the fungus. And the fungus 
On the other hand, it's able to obtain carbon easier thanks to the sugars from the plant. It's a win-win situation. Once that happens, plants are able to colonize the land. They start looking very yummy and wherever there is food, there will be an animal that will come after it. So um, it's then where you have this very rapid div diversification of these three groups of life because of that new environment that opens up. Um, another thing to consider from this illustration is um, how diverse the kingdom fungi on itself is. There are two big phyla that we can observe. We, uh, and they are the two phyla that you are going to uh, encounter more frequently in the forest floor. And those are Ascomycota and Basidiomycota. Those are the two phyla that create the biggest uh, specimens of mushrooms. In Ascomycota, you can find things like lichens in the barks of trees. Um, you can also find demorels. Thank God for April. Um, you can find the cups. Um, there's an orange, orange cup fungus that's quite common in this area, and that belongs into the Ascomycota. But you also find a lot of fungi that have direct impacts into human life, like um, penicillium, which is the genus of fungus that produces penicillin. And thanks to that genus, most of us are still alive today. You also find the yeast, thanks for Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is the fungus used for bread and for beer and for wine. So um, we also find a lot of the fungi that make the cheeses. So we have really strong ties to the phylum Ascomycota. In the phylum Basidiomycota, you find the normal looking fungi, meaning those mushrooms that have the appearance of the umbrella-like mushroom as we see depicted in the picture. But we also have the jellies, those mushrooms that tomorrow would be a great day to go explore in the forest for. Those are mushrooms that are typically 80 to 90% water, and you can only see after a really big downpour like we've had today. So if you have a minute tomorrow, head to the forest and look for the jellies, they are going to be to die for. You also find the rusts, the smuts, the brackets. The brackets are those mushrooms that are shelf mushrooms growing directly out of the bark of trees. And in the stem of this illustration, you have a lot of microfungi. Those phylum that unless you're out there with the knowledge of what to look for and a microscope, you're likely not gonna be able to see them. And all those mushrooms, the little ones, the bigger ones, and the ones in between have very important jobs to be doing in the ecosystem. Many, as I mentioned before, are plant decomposers. They are the ones that are opening those cellulose cell walls and freeing the, the nutrients that have been incorporated into the cell out into the ecosystem. But not all fungi are waiting for things to die. There are many that are there already as the plant is leaving 
helping them have better lives. And that happens at the leaves, at the stems, at the roots, at all the parts in the plant, there is a community of fungi that are helping them stay healthy. And that not happened just with plants, but with us too, with all animals. Think about it. If, if fungi are the major decomposers of cellulose, if there's anything in this planet eating a plant, there has to be a fungus inside those bodies to help decompose cellulose and process that material. And that's the case for all animals. But not only in the guts do we have symbionts, we also have symbionts in our nails, in our hair, in our skin. It's part of the healthy microbiota that all animals have. Now, the two categories that are coming next are um, usually depicted as negative, but please don't hate on my friends. It's a dirty job, but somebody has to do it. So it's through the pathogenic interactions, both plant and animal, that fungi help mother nature to keep a balance in the ecosystem. The deep, the denser and deeper it is, the population, the more likely it is that that population will encounter the pathogens. It is when the density is high and the stress in the population is high that the immune systems of those populations are lowered and the fungi have a better chance of gaining a significant advantage. Um, and even then, fungi do represent a really important um, aspect of our lives, and they are used in human food, in medicine, not just penicillin, but the statins are derived from fungi as well. Um, many other antibiotics that we have um, that we use in addition to penicillin are derived from fungi. And in these days, there are more materials being explored uh, thanks to the kingdom fungi, such as mycelium used in construction materials or in leather, in fall leather. Um, and one of these days, I swear, I'll be able to give one of these presentations dress head to toe in fungi until then. <laughs> now, as we come back into what is more likely for us to see during our lives, this is the anatomy that you are most likely going to be encountering frequently. In the forest, uh, most people, what they pay attention to is the typical mushroom anatomy. Those that look like the orange one in the center or the red ones in the side. Um, when you look at a mushroom, it's important that you take a look at all the parts. Um, many times when people are trying to identify, identify mushrooms, for the first time, they just take a picture from the top and that is good and dandy. But if it's not a mushroom that we are super aware of, it is as, as useful as taking a picture of me like this and asking, who is that? <laughs> um, if you know my nails, <laughs> you might be able to tell that's me, but other than that, it's really hard. So let's be a great uh, educated group and take a look at the entire fruiting body. And let's start with the cap. So in the cap, you have at the top 
a membrane that it's called a peleus. And the peleus is the very top and it could be ornamented with striations or scales or slime. Right now, because there have been so much rain, most of the mushrooms that you're going to be encountering in the forest are viscid, meaning they have a little bit of slime on top of them. Um, you can also have powdery, powdery caps, which is the case of some species in the genus Amanita. You can have uh, also uh, those uh, scales and warts. Some of them peel uh, easily, some of them do not. Now, when you continue looking down, it's important to see the margin, to see if that margin has been enrolled or is smooth or is also um, striated. And then let's look under the cap. That area under the cap, it's called the spore producing surface. And there are three modalities that that spore producing surface can exhibit in a mushroom of this group. So the first one, the most common and the one that we are most accustomed to are gills. And those are those lines that you're going to see or those layers that you're going to see that go from the stem all the way to the margin. But there is also other types of mushrooms um, in the family of the bolids that instead of having lines or gills will have pores. And you're going to see little holes that when you cut a cross section across those that cap, you're gonna see that they're just the endings of really long tubes full with spores. And the third modality that a mushroom like this can have is not lines, not pores, but teeth. And those are going to be like little spines um, that are lined with spores as well. All three modalities are just strategies that are trying to increase the amount of spores that are produced within the same area. Going down from the cap into the ground, it's important to look at the stem. How is the spore producing surface attached to the stem or not? Um, the stem itself, does it have ornamentation? Does it have a little ring around it? Does it have lines or reticulations? All of those are identifiable characteristics. And then at the base of the mushroom, you may or may not have a cup structure called a vulva. You could also have scales instead of a vulva, or it could be completely naked. It's important that when you are in the forest, you bring a pocket knife with you so that you can take the knife about one inch away from the base of the stem, stab the ground next to the mushroom and lift. That lift will allow you to bring up the base of the mushroom so that you can see the characteristics such as vulva, scales, or maybe mycelial strands. This, I understand, is a little more complex of an image, and I don't expect you to remember all of it. What I really want you to get out of these images is that number one, 
the mushroom is the product of the sexual reproduction on the species. There are ways that the mycelium can reproduce asexually and it produces really minimalistic structures. When you see a mushroom the size of the ones that you usually find, that is a lot of energy that has been invested into the sexual reproduction. And the two biggest group that you're going to see that in is um, that produce that those big mushrooms in the forest are, like I mentioned before, Basidiomycota and Ascomycota. The other message that is important for us to keep in mind is that as you see in this illustration, after the mushroom has been formed and um, it's opening the gills, the spores haven't produced yet. As a matter of fact, the mating types of the two fungi that came together haven't even combined the nuclei yet. So it's important that when we are out harvesting mushrooms, we do our best to pick only mature specimens because it's only when the mushroom is fully open and the gills are exposed that the, the spores have had the chance to be released. Remember the entire purpose of creating a mushroom is to release the spores. So please pick only mature specimens. In the right hand side of this illustration, there is also that um, same life cycle, but for the phylum Ascomycota, which is the most diverse phylum. <clears throat> And again, you have two mating types that will find themselves in the forest, who will love themselves very much, and will come together to, find, to form a mushroom. It's only when the mushroom has had time to mature that those nuclei will combine and form the spores that will be released into the environment. I want to make a pause here and verify that there are no questions. No questions in the chat right now. Does anyone have a thought or a question or anything that you'd like to share? Thank you so much so far. Everything is wonderful, by the way, also. Oh, we oh. have a hand. We have a hand. Go ahead. So have you ever, have you guys ever heard of the bleeding tooth mushroom? Yes, I have. Um, I just meal. I, I the, the species is pecky eye. Um, so yeah, I've heard of the bleeding tooth. <clears throat> it's a very interesting uh, mushroom to observe. Do you know why it's, it's called the bleeding tooth? Because it looks like um a tooth with right. little dots of blood on it. Yes. So when you come to the anatomy of a mushroom, what you're seeing in the <clears throat> in the bleeding tooth, I think he nellum pecchii, something like that, um, is not gills, not pores but actual teeth. So the mushroom is using the spine, uh, the spine version of the uh, spore producing surface to create more spores. Now, I don't know if you know this, but mushrooms can sweat. So when they are absorbing a lot of water from the environment, they, might be drinking a little too much and they end up sweating that through the tissue. In the case of the bleeding tooth, what happens is that the sweat of that mushroom 
is red. So it looks like blood on top of a mushroom that on top of that has gills. How very Halloween-y of that mushroom, don't you think? There is absolutely no way that mushrooms can sweat. I am so yes. surprised. Yes, they do, they do. It's called mutation. I and mean, it's all those droplets that are going to be collecting on the top of the mushroom because they drank too much. How can mushrooms sweat? Uh, so yeah. it's, it's not really sweating like you and I sweat, but I use the anatomy, uh, analogy, sorry, <clears throat> of sweat because is water that was incorporated into the body and then came out through the pores, in our case, through our skin pores. In the case of the mushroom, the mushroom is absorbing a lot of water, so much so that it absorbs too much and it secretes it out through the tissues on top of that mushroom. Thank you for your question. Do we have anybody else? When you were discussing going into the woods to look for mushrooms, we had a few people in the chat sharing about how they've been seeing lion's mane recently. Yeah, very good. So lion's mane is a fantastic mushroom that is edible. It has teeth instead of gills or pores. And it's fantastic for your brain functions. As mushrooms go, they don't have a lot of caloric value, but what they do have that is valuable for, valuable for us is the secondary metabolites. They have a lot of good chemistry that helps our brain, helps our bodies, and it helps our immune system to stay in tip top shape so we can fight disease. They're really good for us. And um, herisium or lion's mane is one of those fungi that appears mostly during the fall. But because this winter or this fall has been a little longer than usual, then we are able to still see it and find it today. So I hope that you are, um, you are harvesting ethically your mushrooms when you find them. Okay. All right. Just a second ago, but I saw the hand go down. Was there something else that you wanted to share? Oh, the lion's mane kind of looks like cauliflower. Yeah, it does. All right, thank you so much. So um, when we are out in the forest looking for mushrooms, it's important to get to know what we are seeing um, by reading the descriptions that we can find in the mushroom guides. So I know that those descriptions can be a little gnarly sometimes, so I'm really grateful that Dr. Sharon Nix has developed a guide for us to see visually what those terms in the description means. So right here at the end of the presentation, I will give you a QR code that you can scan and get the guide downloaded into your device as well. So really, <clears throat> when you are seeing a mushroom for the first time, it's important that we pay attention to all the information that we are observing. And the first thing that you're gonna see just because it's higher up in from the ground up is the cap shape. And most mushrooms, when you find them, will start subglobular because they are closed up. 
Remember, mushrooms start their lives in the egg-shaped phase. As they grow, that shape, it's going to change a little bit depending on the genetic information that mushroom carries. That's why when we read the descriptions of particular species, we'll see that the cap is from subglobular to convex. That means that they start subglobular, but when they are mature, they exhibit a more convex form. And there's sometimes that mushrooms will go from subglobular all the way to funnel shape. Young mushrooms are closed up. All mushrooms go, yay, let's explore. The, let's expose my spore producing surface so all the spores can come out. Um, and that is the function of inverting up that spore producing surface. So all those spores can be caught up by the wind. The caps are also covered, as I mentioned before, with different structures or ornamentations. And here is what uh, fibrils are gonna be lines that are embedded into the pileus of that mushroom cap. You can have patches or warts or uh, scales. So pay attention to what is happening at the top of that cap. In the side of the cap, that's called the margin. And that's where you're going to see whether the margin is involuted, meaning it's rolled inwards, or is upturned, meaning that mushroom is getting ready to raise the spore producing surface, or is wavy. Um, chanterelles in summer, um, exhibit that wavy margin or that lobed margin. So all of that are is information that we can use for identification. But the identification doesn't stop at the cap. It's really important to look at the stipe and at the base of that stipe as well. So you may have a stipe that is bulbous, meaning it's a little bigger at the base than the rest, or it could be a stipe that is uh, rooting, meaning you thought the stipe ended here, but you have a root over here that's still under the surface. So that's why it's so important to do that technique of leverage to bring the base of the mushroom up. And once you've observed all those characteristics of the cap and the top, the cap and the stipe, I'm sorry, then make sure you make a cut through the spore producing surface or through the entire mushroom. So you can see what's inside of the stipe, but also any um, latex that might be coming out through the gills or any color change that you might experience through the pores of a bolid. All of that are, is information that helps on identification and honestly, fantastic magic tricks to show the children. In this area, in the DMV area, we have a lot of summer bolids that are yellow with a red cap. And when you cut through that, they immediately turn from yellow to blue, navy blue. It is fantastic to observe. So take the time to get to know the individual that you are seeing and to document any latex, latex that comes out or any color changes as well. 
And then the stipe itself can be ornamented um, and it doesn't really need to be in the center. That is the case of the oyster mushrooms that you might be able to find tomorrow too. Um, or the, uh, tomorrow will be a good, day for the velvet foot mushroom as well. And depending on where that mushroom is growing, it may or may not have a central stem. Um, and that is information that aids on identification too. And just to give you an idea of how diverse the kingdom fungi is, I am putting here for your benefit, this illustration that brings the macro fungi only, the diversity on that poster. Of course, this poster is huge. So I am not, um, I'm not projecting the entire poster here. It's just a placeholder for you to get the link and download that poster into your computer so you can enjoy the diversity of the kingdom like you've never seen it before. Now, even when I'm no longer in front of your computer, I still want you to be enamored with the kingdom fungi. And the best tool that I can leave you with is iNaturalist. There are other applications that help with identification of different species, but I love iNaturalist because it's the most robust database that we have so far. It brings in observers from all around the world and it incorporates data from all around the world. It works in different um, devices, multiple platforms, in your computer, in your tablet, Android or iOS, iPhone. It works on anything. The most powerful version is on the computer. And I use my iPhone version the most because it's what it's the camera that I take out in the forest with me. <laughs> so it's, it's really a powerful learning tool that you can use even when you don't have somebody um, teaching you what it is that you're seeing. So in an observation, observations become as good as the pictures that you incorporate on them. So it's, important that you take multiple pictures from diff different angles and then allow the location services on your phone to be activated for your camera. And if you excuse me, I'm gonna shift a little bit. Wait. All right, so allow your um, the location services to be activated on your camera. So when you upload the images into iNaturalist, they will already come with where exactly you observed that um, mushroom and at what particular time. I strongly recommend that if you are going to go looking for mushrooms, you download iNaturalist and then um, join the Mycological Association of Washington, DC, both as a member and the project on iNaturalist. Now, if you're serious about going to the forest and learning more about mushrooms, Please take a picture of the screen right now. <laughs> it is, like I said, the observations are as good as the pictures and the time that you put into taking those pictures. So it's in many cases impossible for us to do an identification because 
the picture itself doesn't carry all the information we need to make an identification. So I have written in here the steps that you need to do in the, way, in the order that you need to do them to give you the best chance at capturing the information you need. So when you see a mushroom and you want to document it, don't touch it. <laughs> Before you touch it, you need to take a picture that shows where it is growing from, in which environment. Is it attached to a tree? Is it attached to a living plant? Is it growing from the ground? Is it growing from an animal? Um, so that's what I of what I mean by photographing the habit also. Is it growing by itself or is it in a cluster or does it look like a bouquet? And take that telltale picture of the cap because although it's not sufficient for all the identification, it does have information that we need. Once you've captured those conditions, then you're ready to detach the mushroom from the ground. So take a picture of the underside, the spore producing surface, cut through that spore producing surface and check if they are color changes or secretions. And if there is color changes, please, uh, annotate those observations in the notes section on iNaturalist. And it's good to smell your mushrooms. 70% of your mushrooms will have a very non-descriptive mushroom smell, but there's that 30% that smell like pool water or they can smell like almonds, or they can smell like um, apricots. Chanterelles are said to smell a little bit like peaches or nectarines or apricots. Um, and not too far, not too long ago, I, it blew my mind because after all these years of study, September was the first time that I smell a mushroom that smelled like beef stew. It was incredible. Just the smell of that bullet made my mouth water because it was just like I was smelling beef stew. It was fantastic. So give yourself the chance to have that new and exciting experience of smelling your mushrooms and annotating that information on a naturalist. <clears throat> now, in the Mycological Association of Washington, DC, we have chosen to focus on the study of bolids and brochulas of the DMV area. And this is what a bolid looks like. So if you are out in the forest and you see a stubby little mushroom <laughs> that instead of gills has spores on the underside, you are looking at a bolete. And we will be interested in studying that observation. Um, if you are interested in participating in the DNA research part, of the Mycological Association of Washington, DC, you are gonna want to get my email, which is plastered through the presentation at the beginning and the end. Um, so you can contact me about how you can do it. But basically we have this observation here to show you the picture of the habit. So I'm seeing that this mushroom is growing from the ground and not only from any ground, but ground that is covered in moss. So that gives me also 
uh, the information that is a mossy area that has a lot of a lot of water <clears throat> and that the trees that are around are deciduous, deciduous trees. I see leaves that have fallen. I don't see any conifer needles. So just right there, there is a lot of information. Now in the next picture, I'm able to see the peeling stem and the margin uh, of that mushroom that is upturned a little bit. In the third picture, not only do I see the base of the stem and the spore producing surface, but I'm also seeing that there's a color change. Martin, who is the person who did this observation, took a knife through the spore producing surface of that bullet and showed that the spores are no longer yellow, but they are now blue. And he cut through the cap of that mushroom and it shows in fact that the mushroom is turning blue. So that observation of Bolitos Patrioticos is mwah, chef's kiss. All the information that need to be there is there. So what happens with the data once we have it on iNaturalist? Well, in the case of our project for the Mycological Association of Washington, D.C., we use that data to compare different mushrooms that have been observed, um, to compare the different species, to see if they um, look the same. And we also use iNaturalist as a depository for our sequence data so that we can use it, but other scientists can use it too. So I have a quick uh -huh. question for you. Um, someone is wondering if there are any fungi in Maryland whose spores are harmful to humans. Well, <laughs> so the spores, um, as a general rule, they're not harmful. There is the case of people with respiratory illnesses and um, asthmatic people, basically, because the spores are particles, right? And the problem with people that have asthma is that any particle in the air pipe is can be triggering to the lungs and can trigger that immune response and that lack of oxygen. So it's not really that the mushroom is harmful, but just that that particular human is sensitive to all particles, for example. There's also people with immunocompromised bodies that with extended exposure to fungal spores can develop mycosis. Again, it's not really that the mushroom has evolved to be harmful, but that the natural system for that particular individual has been weakened and mushrooms will eat what they want to eat. <laughs> um, but for 98% of the population, no, the answer is no. Great, thank you. Thank you, great question. All right, so tips and reminders when you're out in the forest. If you are turning logs as one does when we're looking for fungi and wonderful things in the forest, it's important to replace the log, like put it exactly as you found it so that the invertebrates and the fungi that live under that log can continue enjoying that environment just the way it was. Now, if you're like me, somebody who in an outing of a Monday 
afternoon will take about 600 pictures, I encourage you to bring an extra charger or a battery pack because you don't want to be um, in the forest finding something super cool and then you're all of the sudden out of battery. Um, you always want to keep yourself safe and bring that a bottle of water as well. Um, it's extra bonus points if you bring a smart, small ruler or a coin for scale to put in your picture. So when people are trying to help you make identifications, they have a sense of how big that mushroom is. Um, I love to look at fungi that are super small. So I do have an adapter in the back of my phone that allows me to do macro shots of uh, fungi. But if you don't have that adapter, just having a hand lens and placing it uh, in front of your camera lens does the same effect. Um, Having a flashlight or an extra light source, it's really useful when you're in the thick of the forest because there's no much light in the forest floor under those conditions. So you bringing your own flashlight ensures that your pictures can be as good as you can produce them. And if you have a piece of white paper cardboard or even a black fleece to separate your subject from the background to capture all those little details, it's even better. Now, um, if you have a fungus that is growing on something else alive and you don't know what it is, you can still do the observation for that something else so that you have more information for the identification of the mushroom. Now, when I say identify that host of the mushroom, I use the word identify loosely because telling me if it's a hardwood or a conifer is an identification. It's not very specific, but it's really useful um, considering some uh, of the species that we have out there, which is the case of Ganoderma suji versus uh, Ganoderma lucidum. The difference is where you are on the globe and if the tree that it's attached to is a conifer, or a hardwood. So just knowing that is useful. However, if you know that instead of just being an oak, you're dealing with a pin oak or you're dealing with a red oak, that is fantastic. Just give us as much information as you have. Hardwood versus conifer, great. Pin oak versus water oak, great as well. Just give us as much as you have. And then inevitably, when I talk about identifying mushrooms, people talk about the poisonous ones. So it's really important to know that mushrooms would be harmful to you when eaten. Smelling is okay, touching is okay, looking is fantastically okay. It's only when you consume things that you don't know that you can get into trouble. And in this area, there is very few species of poisonous mushrooms. However, we do have deadly species of poisonous mushrooms. So I have placed those um, serial killers right here in the presentation for you. Um, the white mushroom that you observe 
is Amanita bisporigera, otherwise known as death angel. And the, mush the brown mushroom next to it is Gallorina marginata, otherwise known as the funeral bell. You get my drift, right? <laughs> so the bottom line here is to get to know the poisonous mushrooms in your region first um, to ensure that you are keeping yourself safe. Do not consume what you don't know. It took me quite a number of years. Um, I believe five years before I trusted myself enough to eat a mushroom without anyone else confirming their identity for me. Um, and only, and today there's only about 15 species after almost 20 years of study. Wow, it's been a while. <laughs> but um, not 20 years, but a, a little less of study. There's only a 15 species that I will eat without consulting someone else. Um, so it's important that you get to know mushroom by a first and last name, that you are as sure as eating a banana. You know a banana, you know what it smells like, you know what it tastes like, you know what it looks like. You will not be mistaking a banana for something else. That is how sure you should be of a mushroom identity when you eat it. Um, so important that if you're collecting mushrooms for um, identification away from a, away from the forest that you use either wax paper or paper bags to store your mushrooms. Do not store your mushrooms on plastic for long periods of time. That is the best recipe to have smelly bits of goo in your house. <laughs> you need them to breathe, all right? So here I have a few species that will give you the first start of identifying mushrooms around your backyard. And we are starting with the most misidentified species in the DMV, possibly around the globe. It is Tramnetes versicolor, otherwise known as turkey tail. Why is it so much misidentified? Because there is a lot of other species that look just like it. And it doesn't help to have that bursy color in its name, which means color varies a lot. <laughs> so Tramides or turkey tail can exhibit different colorations at different times of the year. Around this time of the year, instead of having the reds and the browns that you see in this picture, are you are going to find more grays and blues. And that is due to the temperature change in the environment. If you were to take a fresh specimen that has the grays and blues and bring it to 70 degrees or inside, within two hours, you have a red and brown specimen again. So how do you tell turkey tail apart from its lookalikes? Well, the very first thing is that cap is going to be oh so deliciously velvety. It has so many dense um, hairs at the top. And when you run your fingers through that cap, it's like touching velvet. When you turn that mushroom on the underside, you're gonna see a pure white surface. And when you bring your hand lens to that surface, 
you're gonna see teeny tiny pores um, on that white underside. It's going to grow on dead wood. It's a wood decomposer. And by the way, this is also a very medicinal mushroom. Tea from these mushrooms um, and extracts from this mushroom have been studied for its anti-cancer properties. It is an immune system booster for, um, for humans. A smaller mushroom, but super common in this area is the common bird's nest fungus. Um, it is so common that even in mulch outside shopping centers and drive throughs I have seen it there. And tomorrow is a great day to go looking for mushrooms out, including Cursivolum levi. It is called the bird's nest fungus because it does look like a bird's nest However, it's about one centimeter or less in diameter. So it's very teeny tiny. Um, those eggs that you're observing are called peridials and they are sacs of spores that when the rain hits the middle of that cup, they get propulsed into or catapulted into the air and they're able to colonize nearby mulch that way. We also have uh, the honey mushrooms. We are a little bit out of their, um, of their season now since we are um, already in the beginning of the winter. Um, and these are most commonly found during the fall. Now, I've placed here a picture of the mushrooms themselves. They're growing out of a bouquet, if you may. So all coming from out from a single point of attachment. But on the right-hand side, you're going to see the rhizomorphs. It's a mycelial mat that is heavily melanized. It's really hard and it colonizes the cambium of the trees, which means the body of the mushroom is running through the veins of the tree. And unfortunately, that is what kills the tree. The mycelium will colonize the cambium or the veins, and it will clog it up so much so that no water or minerals will go through and that eventually kills the tree. There's another species called Erpex lacteus. Um, what's comical about this particular species is that it changes in morphology so much that it really has been misidentified as a different species by times. Thank God for DNA research, because when DNA extractions became a thing, people went back to their herbarium and found out that all these five different species were the same mushroom. So there's a joke coming around the mycological community that if it's a crust on a fallen branch, it's likely milk, milk to polypore. If it's a white crust on a fallen branch, milk, milk white to polypore. And then I love this particular species. It is one of my favorite species in the world because it is very abundant. You can find it all throughout our area during the fall. And it is bioluminescent. It glows in the dark. So 
um, I have taken many people to night hikes to highlight the glow of Panelo stipticus or the bitter oysterling. This particular species grows on dead wood, um, spring through fall, I believe, uh, but I've only observed the bioluminescence during the fall. So just to remind you that it's important that if you're gonna go out and start um, foraging for mushrooms, that you're absolutely sure of what you are looking for. And I have placed three species here that would be um, good starting points because it's very difficult to confuse them with other stuff. And first is a uh, morel, and those are gonna be appearing during the springtime. In the center, we have lion's mane. What, how did you know that I was gonna have it in my presentation? <laughs> um, so we have two different species here. Um, this one is the most often encountered species. Um, Parisium arenaceus. And the third species that I have here is chicken of the wood. It is a shell fungus. It's a polypore. It doesn't have a stem. So if you see something orange and has a stem, it is not chicken of the woods and it's likely to be poisonous. Don't eat it. But if it's growing out of wood, doesn't have a stem, and is vividly orange, chances are you have found chicken of the woods. Now, caution. Just because things are edible doesn't mean that it's edible for you. So like any introduction of a new food in your diet, start small. See how your body reacts to a small portion of that mushroom. And then if everything goes well the next day, you can indulge a little more. Do me a favor and cook all your mushrooms. All your mushrooms should be cooked for you to be able to access their nutritional value. Now, I have consumed the grocery store's mushrooms raw, but I totally understand that that is just extra fiber in my system, as long as you're awake. And as promised, I have the resources here for you. The first QR code will give you access to the Fleshy Fungi Guide produced by Dr. Charon Nix, where you'll be able to decode visually all those gnarly terms that you can read in mushroom descriptions. And the second QR code, sorry, QR code gives you access to this presentation. I know that um, people enjoy seeing things more than once, and I wanted to give that opportunity to you. So go ahead and scan the QR code. I'll give you 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. I hope you got it. And then on the on the right-hand side are my three favorite books, The Ascomycid Fungi of North America by the Besets is the best investment I have done in a while because there are many guides, um, many mushroom guides out there in the market, but there's only one guide that talks about what ascomycete fungi you'll find in the forest. 
most of the guides out there focus only on basidiomycota. So that is quite an investment. Then under Ascomycota, you have Mushrooms of Northeast by Tim Baroni is absolutely wonderful. And both the Beset book and the Tim Baroni book are available as ebooks, meaning I can get them on my pocket in the forest with me without being worried that I am going to mess them up. That is gold. And then the third one, it's quite a new uh, publication. It came out this year and is the new and improved Mushrooms of North America by the National Audubon Society. And this was written by jo Jacob Polk, who is quite a gifted mycologist. So these are my favorite resources. And if you've seen me hang in the forest, I tend to inspire toy envy, but don't worry, <laughs> you don't have to be envious. The toys are right here. So for seeing fluorescence in lichens, which we have a few species in our area, a 365 nanometer UV flashlight with a black filter. It's a fantastic toy to have. It has given me the greatest oohs and awes that I've experienced in my career. And um, it, this, this one in particular is so powerful that I am able to use it during daytime also. Now, as I mentioned, I do hang around with an attachment in the back of my iPhone that allows me to do macro shots. Um, if you're not an iPhone user, I'm so sorry for you, but <laughs> this second, um, I'm just joking. The, the alternative for Android users is having one of those clip-ons. I enjoy the iPhone version better because the alignment with the camera is already done for you. It's a macro lens attached with a cover. So you just slide it over and it has not just that stop it, allowing you to do very quickly that alignment with your camera. So there are upcoming programs that we have. Um, here in the left, we have a monthly ID calls with iNaturalist. That is a Zoom program that I organize in tandem with the Nature Conservancy, Deborah Barber, and Capital Nature, represented by Anna Kahanui. I represent PG Parks and Planning. Um, so if you want to build up your skills on the use of iNaturalist, please register. The program that's going to happen the second Tuesday of January, it'll be all about lichens by Natalie Howe. And then every, every month, we meet once every month at Mount Rainier Nature Center to do research about mushrooms. So the next date is not listed here. It's gonna be in January. It's gonna be the third Sunday of January. If you want to bring rushulas or bullets for us to process, please arrive at 10 a.m. If you want to just come and interact with us and ask us questions, please arrive at 1 p.m. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much for your time and I would love to entertain your questions. Thank you so much for joining us. This was absolutely wonderful. Um, fungi is fascinating. So I wanna open it up to everyone. If you would like to unmute, ask questions. If you'd like to turn your camera on and ask questions, we would love to hear your thoughts.
How can mushrooms be big? I mean, uh, have like, like be full sized? Well, that is an interesting, that's an interesting question. Do you mean how big can mushroom get? Like the fungus? Or how big, how can they be big as the mushroom itself, meaning the fruiting body? I'm seeing how like tall that can like be for like poisonous mushrooms. Well, for the poisonous mushrooms, I believe they get up to close to a foot. That's how big the poisonous mushrooms can get. However, those are not the biggest mushrooms I have seen. The biggest mushrooms I have seen are approximately two to three feet. They are, um, they are found in tropical places like Costa Rica, um, Central America, and uh, Africa has them too. Those are teratomyces giganticus. Um, and they can get really, really big. They look like uh, beefy umbrellas almost. Thank you. Thank you for your question. And thank you for being here. I'm excited that you were here. Thank you. All right. I see Ron is asking what animals other than humans eat mushrooms. And almost everything. <laughs> like, um, if we think about mammals, there are deer and foxes and mice, rodents love mushrooms. Um, if we think about invertebrates, oh my God, from worms to beetles to um, snails, it, like there's a lot. Mushrooms uh, are part, an integral part of many, many organisms in the forest. Let's see. So I have a question for you. I'm curious if there's a mushroom that you still haven't seen, it's on your bucket list that you really want to see, but you haven't found it yet in person. Yes. So there are, there are a couple actually. I, I want to go to Australia and New Zealand because there's some blue mushrooms that are very dewy on the on the top um that are there are many mushrooms I haven't seen that are in my bucket list um basically everything on the other side of the world like come on <laughs> um there Thailand has really amazing mushrooms and really amazing entomopathogenic mushrooms mushrooms that grow on insects and invertebrates they're they're gorgeous there's this uh photographer called steve oxford that gives me mushroom envy on a daily basis and and his pictures are amazing if you google steve oxford the first result that you're gonna see is his web page That's great. Does anyone else have any questions or any other thoughts they'd like to share before we all head off for the evening? Oh, I see a hand. Go ahead. So is there a fungus that doesn't mind snow? Yes, there are. They, they're very few because usually the cold temperatures tend to slow growth and slow the ability of um mushrooms to absorb water because it becomes solid, right? 
uh, mushrooms are about 70 to 90% water. So they need a lot of water available in the environment, but they need a lot of liquid water available in the environment. However, there are a few. Um, the winter oyster is one of the mushrooms that you'll find in this area that doesn't mind snow too much because it knows it's gonna melt quickly. Um, we have the velvet foot that I mentioned before. Uh, the scientific name is Flamulina velutypis. Um, and that mushroom appears when it during the winter months, which is when you have snow. Um, there are a few others, but like I said, they're the least amount of mushrooms. Most of the mushrooms appear when the temperatures are much warmer than that. Oh yeah, that's cool. I asked this. I asked because um, I heard that it might snow in my area t tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. The cool thing about snow is that when it melts, mushrooms will come, even if there are the teeny tiny mushrooms. So because you're quite young and you have those wonderful young eyes, I'm gonna give you a gift. If you go to uh, the forest after a rain and you go to the bark of trees that have a lot of lichens in the bark, you might see the teeniest, tiniest mushrooms that you can ever see. There is a type of Mycena, which is the name of a mushroom that grows in the bark of trees. And it's only about three millimeters tall. So you really need to get a really cool eye for it but just spend some time looking through the bark and you may be able to see it. That's great, thank you. Um, I see that Brock raised his hand, go ahead. Does mushrooms have teeth? Yes, but not in the sense that you and I have teeth. Our teeth are hard because they have a lot of minerals in them. Mushroom teeth is just the name that some weird mycologists gave to the spines. They're really teeny and stubby under the caps of mushrooms and they're called teeth, but they don't hurt at all. Oh, you're muted, honey. <laughs> So, like, if you, like, went to, like, a weird mushroom and then you tried touching it or, like, put your leg near it, does it, you won't, like, feel it? Does it, like... No, it doesn't hurt at all. So, like, what does it feel like? Does it, like, feel like it's, like, tickling you or something? How does it feel like? It doesn't... I don't experience it as a tickle, um, but you may. It, it's all about how you experience your, the sensory stimuli on your fingers. So I can't tell you how your fingers are gonna feel. Yeah. I, just, yeah. I just enjoy touching mushrooms in general. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have time for one more question. I see another hand, so go ahead. So is there a mushroom that irritates the skin? Is there a mushroom that irritates the skin? Hmm. Not in the sense that some plants can irritate the skin. Now, if you can, if you have an allergy to a particular type of mushroom, you may sense some irritation, but that is more about how your body reacts than a general response. 
in the general sense, no, mushrooms don't irritate skin the way that plant can. It's not like touching poison ivy where 90% of us are going to break out into a rash. <laughs> don't, Correct. Don't touch Correct. poison ivy, but touching mm -hmm. mushrooms is okay. Yes, touching mushrooms is okay. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Well, this has been a great evening. Thank you so much for coming and giving your time. And I hope you have enjoyed the presentation. We all did very much. Thank you for taking time out of your evening for coming to join us. We really appreciate it. So everyone have a wonderful evening. We will see you again in January for our next winter seminar. And I'm actually going to be presenting about the Northern Diamondback Terrapin that we see here in Maryland. So I look forward to seeing everyone and seeing new faces then. And everyone have a great night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.